Good afternoon, everybody. Um, we have a good turnout anticipated today. We're expecting over 200 people. We're now over 110, so we'll have more people joining us as we come as we go along. But we are going to get started since it's three minutes after two. I want to stick to the schedule if we can. So good afternoon. My name is Steve Rinaldi, and I work in the DEP's Bureau of Sustainability. And thank you for joining us today for our third Food Waste Prevention Day event. Um, in, in May of 2019, Governor Phil Murphy signed into law a resolution that designates the Thursday of the third week of September of each year as Food Waste Prevention Day. The goal of this day is to bring awareness to the issue of food waste and to foster partnerships between consumers and businesses in order to create and share impactful solutions to to prevent food waste. Today's webinar will consist of two parts. The first half of today's webinar will feature a panel of experts who will discuss various aspects of food waste reduction. The second half of today's webinar will be the screening of four videos from the DEP's first food recovery cooking challenge. After the videos are shown, you will be able to vote for your favorite. A couple of points I want to mention to you. This webinar is being recorded and a link to the recording and the cooking videos will be sent to everyone who registered for this event. And please note that questions may be submitted by typing them into the questions section of the GoToWebinar panel. And our speakers will take questions at the end of their presentations and we'll have a Q&A at the end of that uh, after all the speakers are done. I also want to mention that those individuals who are New Jersey certified recycling professionals will earn two recertification credits for attending this webinar. Today's panelists are Karen Franchik from the Center for Ecotechnology, Joan Liptrot from Ryder University's Ryder Resource Pantry, and Jennifer Apostle and Olivia Forte Gardner from Replenish, which is formerly known as MC Foods, the Middlesex County Food Bank. So let's get things started. And I would begin with an introduction of Karen Franchik from the Center for Ecotechnology. Karen first focused on sustainability when she and her husband decided to become farmers. They bought an, or, or an organic farm in Winchendon, Massachusetts, and found their niche selling their organic heirloom tomatoes to Whole Foods Market. This led to Karen working for Whole Foods for 19 years, both in operations and sustainability. Fast forward to now, and Karen works at the Center for Ecotechnology as the program manager for Wasted Food Solutions. Karen oversees the creation and presentation of food waste reduction programs to a wide range of businesses and provides outreach, education, and technical assistance to CET's business and community partners. So I'm gonna turn things over to Karen. Thank you, Steve. I appreciate the introduction and I am happy to be here today. I'm just setting up my... There we go. So the Center for Ecotechnology uh, is a nonprofit uh, based in Massachusetts. I am the program manager for Wasted Food Solutions there. Uh, we help businesses and people save energy and reduce waste. For over 40 years, we have helped businesses and institutions implement programs on the ground while contributing and implementing effective public policy focused on these efforts. We partner with a variety of entities, including the EPA, the USDA, Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection, New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection, utility companies, and more to conduct this work. We started in Massachusetts where we were instrumental in establishing some of the first composting programs in the state, but have since expanded to offer programs, uh, program design, technical assistance, and consulting services throughout the Northeast as well as the U.S. So just a few things about what we do. Um, we have a, uh, a website which is very active, it has a lot of great resources on it, um, and one of the things you'll find on there is information about our technical assistance. Um, we offer, in many cases, um, free, no-cost, wasted food assistance, and we believe in meeting businesses and institutions where they are. So we will go out and do site assessments for our various businesses, institutions, and other entities, look at their existing waste streams, identify opportunities to prevent, recover, and divert waste. Um, we can help create customized waste bin signage, do training programs, and also conduct cost analysis. 
This is all at no cost to areas, to businesses and institutions and areas where we are working. And we are currently doing a lot of work in New Jersey. So there are many businesses and institutions in different areas of New Jersey that would be eligible for this. Um, this is a picture of our website. You can see the states that are highlighted in green are states where we have done um, a lot of work and we have state specific resources. So one of the things that we've done to try to make it easier for folks to find information is to provide a specific uh, website page for a different state. So here you can see a snippet of the New Jersey state page. Um, and anything that is highlighted in peach is something that is a direct link you can click on. So you'll see that um, there's a link for both the Bill Emerson Good Samaritan Food Donation Act, as well as the New Jersey Food Bank Good Samaritan Act. These are two laws that protect donors from liability when they donate food to nonprofit organizations. I'm going to talk a little bit more about them in a later slide about the protection, but I just wanted to point that out. And if you click onto the New Jersey State page on our website, you will see this as a pop-up message. Um, we are actually putting on a workshop. It's another thing that we do to try to help businesses and institutions. And this one happens to be um, relevant to New Jersey. So we're gonna be putting on a workshop on October 13th, um, helping businesses and institutions with strategies to prevent, donate, and divert waste. And we're doing that in collaboration with the New Jersey DEP and the New Jersey Composting Council. So uh, if anyone is interested, you can go to our state, uh, to our website and go to the New Jersey State page and you'll see that pop up. So having said that, um, that's the work that we do. And we do obviously work um, across the food recovery hierarchy that the EPA has provided. Um, and we will help businesses and institutions um, with whatever aspect we can, not just whatever they might um, ask us to do, but we try to help them in other ways as well. But today we're here to talk about donations, so that's what I'm going to focus on. So when it comes to donating surplus food, there are a couple of things that um, people get concerned about. Um, most businesses, if you ask them why they don't donate food, the first thing that comes to mind is liability protection. So that's where we really want to make sure people understand that uh, businesses are protected um, as long as they uh, keep food in the same condition that it would be sold in. So if a business donates apparently wholesome food in good condition to a nonprofit organization, they're protected from legal liability. So that basically means that they need to keep it the same as they would if they were gonna sell it or serve it. So if it needs to stay refrigerated, then they keep it refrigerated. If it's a frozen item, it needs to remain frozen. As long as there is no, uh, no obvious damage to packaging and there's no spoilage, there's no off smells or anything, um, as long as it looks good and they've kept it in good condition and they would otherwise sell it or serve it, then they're able to donate it. So I think that's one of the most important things to really understand is that it's the first thing that people tend to bring up, but there's a lot of protection about it. And in particular, New Jersey is a state that offers extra protection beyond the federal law, and that's really important to know. One of the other things that CET has done is we worked with the Harvard University's Food Law and Policy Clinic, um, and they produce fact sheets for various states um, at times to get into some more specifics for that state. Um, and we've talked to them about coming up with state-specific uh, fact sheets for New Jersey. So it's one of the things that we're hoping to work on with them over the next six to nine months. Those fact sheets tend to get a little more into detail, um, which offers really good information and support for the businesses that might be interested in donating. And they tend to focus on things like um, tax incentives, the actual liability, um, as well as uh, date labeling, because a lot of folks have concerns about date labeling as well when they're donating food, um, and sometimes animal feed. If you're donating food that specifically goes to feed animals, there can be different rules and uh, regulations. And so those fact sheets can be super helpful. So that's one of the things that we're hoping we can get done this year um, for New Jersey specifically. The other big aspect of uh, donation, of course, is the community aspect. The biggest winner when businesses choose to donate is the community. Um, and with so many food banks and food rescue agencies located throughout the state, there are a lot of ways to get good food to people in need. Um, and as you can see by this quote, there's a lot of food that is currently being rescued. This is a quote about the Community Food Bank in New Jersey rescuing nearly 9 million pounds of food um, from grocers. So I think it's a, it's a really nice quote. Um, when businesses are looking to develop a food donation program, there's a couple of different areas that they really look at um, to focus on in order to get the logistics straight. Um, one of them is that businesses will have different varieties of 
of food to donate on different days. Obviously, if they had the same amount of the same item every day, then they just need to make a, a change and not produce or buy as much of that item. So it tends to go up and down, and that can be a challenge for both the business or institution that's donating as well as the agency that's receiving it. So one of the biggest recommendations that we make when working with businesses is that they establish a partnership with a local food pantry or rescue agency. Um, that way they can have really great communication about when they have much more than expected or much less than expected. Um, and it gives the agency really good information for how they can move forward. Um, the biggest problem for businesses that they need to kind of work through, not a problem, but the biggest challenge is to look at storage, labeling, packaging, and transportation needs. And that's where working closely with a partner uh, food rescue agency can really be helpful. Another great partner for businesses and institutions that actually can be health inspectors. Uh, one of the common misconceptions is that health inspectors discourage donation or that there are fines for donating surplus edible food. Uh, more health inspectors support donation than don't. They just are concerned that businesses understand the issues around food safety and have a plan for dealing with those issues. So health inspectors can be super helpful uh, because they touch so many different food businesses. They have the opportunity to educate many different people about the benefits of donation, um, which helps the community as well as the New Jersey's goal of reducing food waste. So I think one of the keys here is to make sure that um, health inspectors understand um, what the challenges are and that they help the businesses to think through those challenges um, at, as they can. Um, it is an area that we feel is really important at CET, so it's actually something that we're focusing on again over the next year in a couple of different uh, geographic regions that we're working in. We are working on materials and resources to help health inspectors to understand the donation process in, bis in various sectors of businesses um, and to be able to talk to them um, to, to encourage more donation um, safely. Some opportunities and challenges, um, we talked a little bit about the more food, less food. Um, there's also infrastructure challenges, and again, this is on both sides, the business that's donating as well as the agency that's receiving. Um, and one of the biggest opportunities as well as challenges now um, is technology. Uh, I'm sure everyone is aware there's just so much going on in the world of food waste these days, which is super exciting, but there's always new apps, new technology platforms, um, new programs going on. And so being able to find ways to leverage um, that technology um, for better donation can be super important. Um, one example that comes to mind is the city of Philadelphia. The Parks and Rec uh, Department decided that they needed to have a better system for donating food from rec centers. So they were able to uh, to look at all the different uh, apps and, and different ways that people were, the rescue agencies were getting the food and they decided to focus on just two, um, one of them being Means and one of them Food Connect. And they were able to have the food agencies, the food rescue agencies using those to coordinate all of the donations. And they found that they were able to get much better donations uh, it was it streamlined everything and the donations worked out much better. So it was an example of where a city took the initiative to go out and look at what was there, talk to the food rescue agencies, get their input, and then come up with a system that was going to work for everybody and that resulted in more donations overall. So, um, and here you can see a couple of different um, opportunities to get involved with food rescue, including uh, the means database, which I was just mentioning, um, the state of Rhode Island has used it as well. So you have a city like Philadelphia that's using it and then an entire state um, that's encouraged food rescue agencies to use it just as a way to streamline information and to make it easier for donors as well as agencies to know what's out there and to make sure more food gets donated. Um, and of course, we also have um, the Community Food Bank of New Jersey here, as well as the Food Bank of South Jersey. I just wanted to very quickly go through a couple of case studies, um, again, just to talk about the different areas where people are able to donate. So this one happens to be a Food Recovery Network um, student chapter in California. Uh, and as you can see, they were able to recover um, over 16,000 pounds of food in uh, one academic year. Um, to surplus food that was connected, collected from um, dining halls, et cetera, and then redistributed to local homeless shelters. Um, colleges and universities, especially when they have the Food Recovery Network type of chapter, um, they, can, they can do a really great job. They tend to have very um, interested and motivated students who want to do this. Um, and when you can organize a program uh, in this way, it can really be a great way to uh, make an impact. 
This other example is from a Whole Foods Market store um, in Massachusetts uh, that partnered with Foodlink, which is a local food rescue agency. Um, and this one is interesting because Foodlink is a, a larger agency. They take all different kinds of foods. They took perishable and non-perishable, and they essentially go to the store every day and take everything that the, that the store has to donate. And they then um, divide that up and it goes to different um, food banks or different agencies. Um, and that way the store, the business has only one uh, agency that they need to deal with, but all the smaller agencies um, also get what they need. They may be uh, food banks that are only open one day a week, and yet they're able to get what they need um, through these kinds of partnerships. So it's a really great example of um, kind of a, a way to, to use one larger agency and affect the whole community. So, so those are just a few notes on food donation programs. I'm happy to take questions um, if there are any. Thank you, Karen. Uh, it looks like we don't have any questions for you so far. If anybody has questions okay. for Karen, please add them to the question box um, and we'll go through them at the end and we'll move on to the next one. Thank you, Karen. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Great, great job. And as Emily just said, if you have any questions that come up later on, Karen will thankfully be with us for the rest of the webinar. So let's move along to our second speaker, who is Joan Liptrot from Ryder University. Joan serves as the Director of Service and Civic Engagement at Reiner University in Lawrence, New Jersey. Her background includes K-12 education, professional development, and nonprofit management. In addition to overseeing the Ryder Resource Pantry, Joan works with students at Ryder to develop service learning programs, manages the Bonner Community Scholars Program, advises student service clubs and organizations, facilitates partnerships with community organizations, and leads international service learning programs. So that's all you do, Joan? That's it? <laughs> yeah, that's all I do. <laughs> well, I'll turn it over to you now. Um, thank you I'm so a much. Busy person. <laughs> thank you so much, and um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thanks for inviting me to join you all this afternoon to talk about some of the things that we're doing here at Ryder University. Um, I'm going to focus on the work through our Ryder Resource Pantry. Um, we are one of, gosh, how about over 900 colleges and universities across the country that has started a food pantry on our campus. Um, research is showing the students, the folks that are coming to college look very different these days than it did 10, 20 years ago. And a lot of our students who are coming are experiencing um, food insecurity and, and other challenges. And research is even showing that um, one in three college students has experienced food insecurity in the past six months. So we decided to um, start a food pantry. First, I'll explain Ryder is a small private institution between Trenton and Princeton. Um, we're kind of in a suburban setting and we have uh, about 3,600 undergraduate students and about 800 graduate students. A group of concerned staff members came together um, in late 2017 um, and we've been talking about opening a food pantry for some time we finally got the go-ahead in february of 2018 um, and we're able to find a location um, and and start a food pantry and since then we've seen about 200 students each academic year oops sorry i'm having it oh. Um, our pantry is dedicated to providing food and other essential items to support our students so that they can be successful. We know that if you're hungry, then you're focused on that and not focusing on what you need to to be successful um, in your classes. And our pantry is open to any writer student, um, even those that are, you know, on a part time basis. So pretty much any student that has a valid student ID. Um, we first started out offering, as you can see, lots of different um, shelf stable items. Um, that was the easiest way to go, right, when we got our approval from our local health department. Um, we also wanted to make sure that we tried to focus on healthy options for our students. We know that most students, right, when you don't have a lot of money, will um, go to ramen and those kinds of things, which are very high in sodium. So we wanted to give them some healthy options. 
We also were really fortunate that early on in opening our pantry, someone donated a freezer. So we were able to offer frozen items to students. And then just this last spring, because of generous donations of our alumni, um, we were able to purchase a refrigerator so that we now can offer students um, fresh produce uh, and dairy products. Everything we do is kind of under the motto of take what you need, use what you take, give back when you can. Um, and our students have really embraced that and, and been really wonderful um, in helping to support our, our pantry. We also offer a number of other items that are not food related. Um, we, we are trying to make sure that we help them with all of their needs, um, also with an eye to sustainability um, as well. Um, we also, uh, in different times of the year, uh, offer coat, a coat drive, hats and gloves, and those kinds of items. So here's how, once we got started, we had this great plan, right? We started um, in the, really in, in February of 2018, and then we were just kind of figuring it out, and then fall of 2019, we got started. We um, identified um, key locations on campus where we could place these red bins that you see um, so that faculty and staff could donate items or students and we kind of put it out there um, when you're shopping and you're picking up items for yourself think about picking up an extra item or two for someone who might need it whether that be a food item or um, a personal care item we created this great calendar of month by month donations that we would focus on um, to help supply our pantry. We were fortunate that our university um, negotiated as part of our food provider contract that they would make a $5,000 donation to our student pantry. And so in the beginning, that donation was um, of items that they purchased and we went through them and we quickly realized that the price that we were paying to the food provider that supplied the student stores on campus was much higher. The cost was much higher than what we could purchase items for. So we renegotiated that, that they would give us a cash donation of $5,000. And we realized we were able to make that money go much further for our students. So um, we started off with this $5,000 donation. We budgeted about $450 a month. And um, things we had a great start in the fall and then um the pandemic hit and so that kind of changed everything that we were doing not just from the way we operated but in the dramatic increase in the number of students that we saw that needed support from us so in the from from mid march until may we saw 60 students in that time frame 57 of them had never come to the pantry before the pandemic so um, there was a whole new group of students who, who were in need. Um, and all of a sudden, because of the change in the students, um, we also saw an increase in what we needed um, to, to support our students. So we went from our budgeted $450 a month and our little collections, baskets around campus, um, to spending on average $1,117 a month um, to provide food and resources for our students. So we had that $5,000 donation. We were really fortunate. We applied for and received uh, a Nichols for nonprofits donation of $4,000 from Whole Foods in Princeton. Um, their employees get to decide um, where to give their donation. Um, and we were absolutely blown away with the generosity from our alumni. So when the pandemic started, our administration put out a call to alumni and said, you know, we have a lot of students who we had students who were struggling before, um, but now there were many more students who were in need. And we went from really in the fall having about 11 donors, people that donated cash, to currently from that point, from the beginning of the pandemic, we've had over 126 people donate over fifteen thousand dollars 
to our pantry. So um, the outpouring um, we've gotten it has been just incredible. We've gotten emails and and messages from alumni who said, you know, I really struggled when I was a student, and I wish this resource had been there for me. So um, we we're really really happy and fortunate to be able to do that. Um, in addition to that. We also solicited a lot of other donations from organizations in the community before the pandemic and beginning in September of um, 2019, we were part of the day and donation program from Panera. And so once a week, we would receive a huge donation of baked goods um, that we would then repackage and then be able to have available in the pantry for students. Um, we also, as you can see, um, just reached out to as many different organizations as we could. We, they had started that fall a farmer's market on campus to um, to make fresh produce available to students, faculty, and staff. And the farmers were really generous in donating the produce to us at that time. Um, we didn't have a refrigerator, so we had to really move it very quickly. Um, and we learned from that that a lot of students didn't know what to do with a delicata squash. Um, or spaghetti squash. So we were gearing up to do some cooking classes and partnering with our nutritionist through our um, dining services um, for the spring. And then of course, we weren't able to do that. But you can see we also reached out to organizations on campus and actually students stepped up and did that. Um, and they started collecting donations, um, Collect some groups just collected money. Um, even students in our residence hall put together snack bags. Um, and it's really amazing when we put it out there to the students of what two students need. They are always thinking about things that we never even considered. Um, we found, and this is not food related, but one of the biggest requests that we've had from students is laundry detergent. Our washers and dryers are free on campus, but students did not have laundry detergent. Um, we started and we saw how much of that was going through our pantry and the number of those plastic jugs um, was unsettling personally and so we um, this summer started offering um, the laundry sheets um, and educating students on how to use those so um, every time i think that we have things you know, good to go in our pantry. We learn something new and get a request for something else. As I mentioned, um, the uh, pandemic created a really interesting challenge for us um, in getting our students into the pantry. So we developed um, a safe socially distanced pickup system. And so we ran around campus and picked up those bins because most students weren't here. Um, and we placed those in a, in a location near our pantry. Um, and we uh, put all of the items that we had in the pantry in an order form so that uh, students could request the items. We would bag them up, as you see in the photo, and then we would put them in the red bins and they were timed out at 10 minute intervals so that students could be socially distanced when they picked up their items. Um, when we added um, the refrigerated items um, and we had the frozen items, we used coolers uh, to, to do that. And so every day students would disinfect those um, to make it safe for our students. We had started um, when we opened our pantry a meal swipe collection program um, where we asked students to donate extra meal swipes. As part of their meal plan, every student receives five guest swipes um, and most of them don't use them. So we started asking students to donate them. We said you can donate one or five, whatever you want. Um, and last year we collected about 150. We just kind of you did put the word out um, in a small way to students and tried to launch it and see what that would look like. Um, and this year we've partnered with the National Swipe Out Hunger Initiative and developed what our students are calling Bronx Against Hunger. And um, we're hoping to collect a lot more swipes from students that then we will distribute. We also, when a student requests meal swipes, so an off-campus student, um, we meet with them to assess what other needs they may have and ensure that they're accessing the other resources available on campus. Um, we've also had students who um, are local 
and have requested, you know, when we see that they're requesting a lot of the same items every week, um, part of the, the meeting with them is to help give them information about other resources uh, for their families in the local greater Mercer County community. Um, in addition to providing the, the food and the resources for our students and collecting the meal swipes, we're also very conscious about um, other programming that we can do to help address all of the issues that our students are facing. Um, so we are educating everyone on our campus um, about food insecurity, um, talking about food waste, all of those kinds of things, whether it's training our residence life staff or hosting a viewing and discussion of a documentary called Hungry to Learn that looks at the issues of hunger on college campuses. Um, we also have started a program with our students called End Hunger Advocates, where students complete an online course with the Congressional Hunger Center in Washington, DC. Um, and then we send them to do at least 10 to 20 hours of direct service with food pantries and organizations in our, in our local community. So um, we're trying to really not just meet the immediate needs of our students, but we're also trying to help educate everyone um, and change the stigma of, of food insecurity um, and asking for help or, or utilizing the services. Um, we have, since we started, we set up a, a resource pantry advisory board. It's made up of students and staff, um, and we meet once a semester, um, and um, we kind of tell them what we're doing in the pantry and take suggestions from them, um, and also recommendations for, for other things, other programs that we can, we can host. Um, so that's kind of in a nutshell everything that we're doing in our pantry um, unfortunately some of our programming like the donation collection that has had to go on hold because of the pandemic um, but um, we're hoping to reinstate some of those in the next couple of months um, we also Right prior to the pandemic, we're talking with students about starting some food recovery programs on our campus. So we know that everything that we're doing um, is just the beginning and it's continuing to grow and evolve. So um, I'm going to put my contact information in the chat because um, I have to run across campus to meet with a group of students um, and teach a class. So thank you all for um, letting me share with you this afternoon. Emily, do we have any questions for Joan? Yes, we have we have one question. Um, I don't know if I don't know if Joan has a, a chance before. Yep, um, I'm here. Just head out. Oh, okay, great. Thank you. I, I, was, I, yeah. I have a question. So as people well. are wondering. Well, um, so the first question is: someone has a um, a relative who is a sophomore at Rider, and they want they're wondering um, how they can help. I think people are wondering um, what they can do to help. Um, if there's anything you need right now, um, what kind of, what they can do? Yeah, that's a great question and thank you. Um, first of all, tell your family member to stop by um, the pantry, which is in the Vana Center, or come find me. Um, I'm in the student affairs suite and um, we are currently, we're, we're in good shape to get started, um, but we are always in need of all kinds of things. Um, feminine hygiene products is a huge um, item, very expensive, um, that we are always in need of. Um, uh, and just any food items. Um, you know, we have different categories of food, but we also have miscellaneous items. Tell your family member, we're also always um, looking for volunteers. So we have a grad student that really oversees the day-to-day -day operations of the pantry. Um, and then it's run every day um, from 11 to 5 p.m. by students. And then we're also open Wednesday evenings for a couple of hours. So we always need student volunteers for that. And student groups to do collections. Joan, I have a question for you. Um, I'm assuming that 
the students who live on campus go to the dining hall for their meals. So is this program really tailored for commuter students who don't live on campus? So that's a great question. So um, the first year that it was open, we saw mostly on-campus students, right? Um, we do have a number of different types of residence halls on campus. So there are, every freshman has a, a full meal plan. Um, as students progress through their time at Ryder and depending on the housing that they're in, they can choose other meal plans. So some are seven meals a week, right? So that's like one a day. Um, so there's a number of different combinations that they can get. Um, so they might be living in, we have a um, an area that's now, they changed it, it used to be called West Village, but they're apartments with a kitchen. Um, some, we have some suites and some pods and some different makeups. So um, not everybody on campus. And sometimes like those students move to those types of housing things because they think it's gonna be cheaper um, if they, don't have the full meal plan, right? And they're in that kind of setting and that they'll be able to purchase food for themselves. And then our students, we have a lot of commuters, we have a lot of local students, but also we have a, a large number of students that choose to live off campus, right? So they think I'm gonna save money, I'm gonna get an apartment or a house or something like that. And then unfortunately they don't realize that they need to pay gas or electric and water and, you know, all of those other expenses. And so um, they have to keep the electric on and they have to keep their internet going, right? So they can access their, because a lot of the things they need to do are online. Um, and so then food becomes the lowest kind of priority for them. So um, we also, the swipe program, we offer those because we know in a college setting, a lot of socialization happens around food. So if students are working on a project, they might say, let's meet like, so we have like a, it's called Cranberries and it's it's where there's like a Jersey Mike's and a, a Wendy's and like those kind of, it's like a food court. And so students will want to meet in the food court and work. And if you, it, it, you know, if you don't have the money to, to purchase a meal, um, you might be reluctant to go. It becomes kind of difficult and awkward. So our meal swipes actually can be used in that setting as well. Thank you. I have one other question. You're probably familiar with this New Jersey organization called the New Jersey Higher Education Partnership for Sustainability, New Jersey, New Jersey HEPs, New Jersey colleges and universities are interested in sustainability. If not, you should definitely connect with them and share this presentation with them because what, you, what you're doing at Ryder is fantastic. So I'd love to see that, you know, brought to other colleges, campuses in New Jersey. Yeah, oh, and, thanks. If you need a contact person at New Jersey HEPs, we can definitely share that with you too. Fantastic, thanks so much, Emily, Steve. Emily, were there any other questions? There's no more questions for Joan at this time. Okay, then I know Joan has to run, so thank you very much, Joan. Thank for joining you. Us Everybody have a great afternoon. Keep up the great thank work. You, All right, we're gonna move along to our third topic. And we're gonna have two speakers from Replenish. The first is Jennifer Apostle, Jennifer is the director of Replenish, which is formerly MC Foods, the Middlesex County Food Bank, as I mentioned. She has been overseeing the program for over 25 years. She works with a network of more than 140 pantries, soup kitchens, and social service organizations to achieve Replenish's mission of ensuring that all residents in the county have immediate access to nutritious foods and necessities at all times. Jennifer is dedicated to nourishing our neighbors and improving the overall well-being of our residents and achieving food security for all with the support of countless colleagues, volunteers, and partners from community organizations, businesses, schools, and civic groups. Also joining us from Replenish is Olivia Forte Gardner. Olivia joined the Replenish team in July of 2020 to provide additional staff support during the pandemic. Her training in natural resource conservation and diffusion adoption theory lends itself well to developing impactful outreach connecting food waste reduction with increased community food security. She has worked for both federal and university research projects as well as for a cooperative extension. So I will hand it over to both Jennifer and Olivia. Thank you. We cannot hear you right now. You need to unmute. There we go. 
Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having us today. I'm happy to be here and uh, share information about Replenish, the county food bank. Um, first thing I wanted to talk about was food insecurity. Um, when we hear that term, we often may think it just refers to hunger. Um, but in fact, it's two different concepts where hunger is the physical state or feeling of discomfort from a lack of food, while food insecurity, on the other hand, um, refers to the household's inability to provide enough food for every person to live an active and healthy lifestyle. So if a household cannot afford to purchase enough nutritional food for all its members on a consistent basis, it's considered food insecure. There are many causes for uh, food insecurity, which could include unemployment, underemployment, a sudden illness or death in a family. We have many seniors who live on a fixed income and have to make difficult choices between paying for medications or food. And as uh, Joan just made reference to, the college students um, who have to pay for tuition and books and may have little resources left for food. A lack of transportation or a lack of full service supermarkets in certain areas can also be contributing factors uh, to food insecurity. Uh, and so I wanted to talk about the, the big picture, the national food bank structure. Um, Feeding America is the national organization overseeing the food bank system, uh, followed by the statewide food banks. And here in New Jersey, there are five major food banks recognized by Feeding America. And that includes the Community Food Bank of New Jersey, which is the largest food bank in the state, um, covering probably about two thirds of the counties um, then in the Northeast and Central sections of the state. We have the food bank, the, the food bank of South Jersey, Fulfill, um, which is the food bank of Monmouth and Ocean County, um, Norwest Cap, which serves the Northwest section of the state, and Mercer Street Friends. All of the food pantries, soup kitchens, and social service providers fall in under one of those statewide food banks. So replenish, um, in 1994, the Middlesex County Board of Commissioners wanted to address the issue of food insecurity and created what was then known as McFoods to provide a network of support for food pantries throughout the county. Replenish Nourishing Neighbors is the new name and brand identity for McFoods. Uh, Replenish better represents our mission to eliminate food insecurity and nourish not only the bellies of our residents, but also the whole person as we aim to be a network of resources and support for all individual basic needs. Replenish is operated by the Middlesex County Department of Community Services with the support of the Middlesex County Board of Commissioners. In our early days, we operated out of a closet with a network of about 30 partners. Currently, Replenish is a network of over 150 food pantries, soup kitchens, and social service organizations representing all 25 towns in the county. We currently have a 5,000 square foot warehouse and a team of three full-time and three part-time staff members and countless volunteers. We have a box truck, a, a utility van, and two refrigerated trailers. We work with many nonprofits, schools, businesses, civic groups, and local governments to gather food and other necessities to share with our network, who then distribute the food and supplies directly to residents in need within their communities. Replenish also acts as a conduit for important information and resources for clients, and we provide networking opportunities for our partners. We have several local coalitions within the county. There's the Feeding New Brunswick Network, We Feed Woodbridge, Woodbridge Coalition, the We Care Perth Amboy, and Meal, the Metuchen Edison Assistance League. And these group groups meet regularly to discuss needs in their communities, share information and resources, and work together to more efficiently meet the needs of the residents. And Replenish is unique in that we are a government program, so we're not recognized as one of the major food banks, but instead as a hub for our local pantries within Middlesex County. In 2017, a 501c3 nonprofit was created to partner with Replenish as the monetary arm. Feeding Middlesex County is able to collect monetary donations and then make large scale food purchases to be distributed to the pantries through Replenish. We partner with Feeding Middlesex County on various events and activities to raise awareness, food and funds. We have an amazing food pantry network. Um, again, as I said, these food pantries are, 
are over 150 of them uh, that represent all 25 towns in Middlesex County. We also have pantries at both Rutgers University and Middlesex County College that we also work very closely with. There are hundreds of volunteers who dedicate so much of their time and energy to serving others. And these volunteers are using their own personal vehicles to transport food items from our facility back to their location. While that's a wonderful and, and generous on their behalf, it also highlights one of the biggest challenges of the food bank system, transportation. Without commercial vans or trucks, pantries are very limited with the capacity of what they can transport to their pantry. Space and refrigeration back at the pantry site is also another challenge, since most pantries are using closets, basements, or small rooms of a church or local organization, they don't have room to store lar large quantities of food for commercial or for commercial refrigeration. And as Joan um, mentioned in her presentation about uh, the students being in need of laundry detergent, that is also something we've seen among um, residents in Middlesex County. Uh, and one of our food pantries in New Brunswick uh, also started a program called Laundry Love. Uh, so they are uh, collecting monetary donations and then they coordinate with local laundry laundromats in the city where they will designate a couple of nights a month um, for free laundry service. Uh, and they have volunteers handing out the, the donated money to um, offset the cost of um, the machines. And they also uh, purchase laundry detergent to make available. So just wanted to highlight that that's another um, program that we see here that we're working to, to help residents with. So where does our food come from? Replenish receives food through various means. The Community Food Bank of New Jersey is one of our largest partners uh, where the majority of our food comes from. The Community Food Bank provides three tractor trailer deliveries each week that include produce, meats, dairy, and shelf stable products. The food bank also connects us with additional large scale contributions from other retailers, wholesalers, and vendors, which is part of our food recovery initiative. We make regular uh, daily pickups from local grocery stores and retailers to rescue bakery items, produce, dairy, and meats that are too close to their best shelf life to be sold. This food recovery system is part of the National Food Bank system, and all donations are logged and reported back from organizations like Replenish or local pantries up to the statewide food bank and finally back to Feeding America. We also partner with Farmers Against Hunger and our local master gardeners for additional fresh local produce during the gro growing season. And also like Joan mentioned, um, a lot of times we get uh, different produce items that are maybe culturally unfamiliar to certain groups. Um, and again, prior to the pandemic, we had been working to um, create a, a network of, of recipe sharing and cooking demonstrations to uh, help um, with the unfamiliar items. Uh, Throughout the course of the pandemic, we've kind of had to put a halt to some of that, um, but we do have daily emails we send out to our uh, pantry network. And in addition to the information we're sharing with them, we try to include some recipes as well uh, when we get different items in here that we know are going to be hard to push in certain communities. Replenish uh, also partners with many local businesses who provide product donations, host food drives, and volunteer with us. Coca-Cola and Wakefern uh, are some great examples of that. Coca-Cola has delivered over 450,000 pounds of beverages to us over the last 13 years. Coke has also provided volunteers on site at our warehouse and out at events in the community. Wakefern partners with us to donate food used for display purposes at trade shows they also work with us on donating product and making large scale purchases. Um, we're also partnering with Wakefern at a local shop rate store for a stuff the truck food drive coming up on September 25th where staff members will also uh, volunteer. We also work with many faith based organizations, civic groups, athletic clubs and scouts and other organizations who conduct food drives and volunteer with us. The COVID-19 pandemic caused significant impact on food insecurity across the country and especially here in New Jersey. Across the state in 2020, the, the rate rose from a low of 5.2% to a high of 18.2%, according to uh, the Community Food Bank of New Jersey. 
replenished, responded to meet the need here in Middlesex County. We overcame the challenges of the, of the pandemic and found new ways to source and distribute food support our, and support our partner pantries. We adapted the way we operate by erecting a tent to move operations outside. We increased our days and hours of distribution. We increased our regular communications with our, our pantries to ensure they had access to critical information and resources related to the pandemic, testing, vaccinations, housing, rental assistance, mental health support, and much more. We distributed 4.3 million pounds of food in 2020. That's double the 2.2 million pounds from the previous year. We held a countywide drive-through food distribution event serving 1,500 families and facilitated a, part a partnership with Logisticare to arrange for home deliveries to residents who could not get to the pantries. For residents who are in need of food assistance, Replenish maintains a directory organized by town of all the food pantries and soup kitchens in the county. The directory can be found on the Replenish, Replenish section of the Middlesex County website. Um, we also email it out and share it widely with pantries across the county. Throughout the pandemic, the days, hours, and distribution processes of our partner pantries changed frequently. We have continued to ensure that this directory listing remains as up to date as possible so that residents can access accurate information about how and where to receive assistance. This past summer, the county launched a healthy food access map. This interactive map can help residents locate food pantries, farmers markets, grocery retailers, and the transportation routes to help get them there. It's a great tool to help anyone find their way to healthy foods in the area. The map can be found at middlesexcountynj.gov slash healthy foods map. So while the pandemic is beginning to come under control and some things may be getting back to some level of normalcy, food insecurity in our community will continue to remain an issue. The economic crisis created by the pandemic will far outlast the health crisis. Residents will struggle to get back on their feet financially and will continue to rely on food pantries for support. But together, we can ensure our neighbors have access to their most basic needs. There are many ways to get involved and support Replenish and your local food pantries. Food and monetary donations are always welcome, and we are happy to partner with groups to coordinate food drives, both large and small and volunteers are always welcome at our events. Individuals can raise awareness and advocate in support of federal and state programs that support our most vulnerable populations. You can work within your community, with your community food pantries and retailers to develop a local food recovery system in partnership with your statewide food bank. I encourage you to visit our website or social media pages to keep up with us and learn more about how you can get involved. And now I'm going to turn over to my colleague, Olivia, to talk a little bit more specifically about uh, food waste and food recovery. Thanks, Jennifer. Uh, I will push uh, through as fast as practical my portion of this uh, program. But I really want everybody to take note of things that I mentioned that Karen and Joan or Jennifer may have mentioned before. Um, in other words, the more you've heard it, the more important it really is. So um, there will be a couple of things that have been previously mentioned. But um, I wanna to talk to you about food waste and, um, and its reduction. Food waste, you know, it occurs at different levels for different reasons. Um, this could be a product of manufacturers' product guarantees. Uh, it could be store policies, shipping errors, uh, in the home, we know that improper storage or faulty appliances uh, can lead to early spoilage. There's also familial or generational habits, uh, cultural habits around leftovers or how long you keep food. And more and more, we see just an exploding amount of confusion um, circular, uh, about dates on food labels. But what does this food, this waste, uh, food waste look like at the more local level? Okay, next slide. 
Though Replenish does not have breakout numbers for our own Middlesex County, in 2013, Mercer County Improvement Authority conducted its own waste stream study that did reveal how much food is actually being thrown away in Mercer County, and that's our neighbor to the south. A little side note, uh, municipal waste stream, as I have been told, is what is picked up uh, in dumpsters and curbside and what is also being brought individually to the transfer stations. But it is not necessarily a reflection of the total solid waste process. So what the Improvement Authority found is that, is that of the 24.8%, oh, it, I'm sorry, is that at 24.8%, food waste is the largest component in the municipal waste stream. And this figure uh, falls in step with the national EPA estimates of 21.6%. Can you imagine if we could make that percentage fall by say 10% or even more just by source reduction, uh, food scraps recycling, food waste recycling, and feeding hungry people? I mean, th that is amazing. Next. It's an amazing thought that I would love to see happen, and I think it is going to happen, because we have some new state mandates requiring that large generation, generators of food waste uh, reduce and recycle their volumes. And this affects many, many businesses and institutions. Uh, they will be obliged to comply. Uh, these may include schools, universities, hospitals, airports, casinos, prisons, shopping malls, of course, large uh, grocery retailers, elder care and living facilities, and on. We feel that there are opportunities in food recovery and its redistribution, particularly with the grocery retail sector, uh, which will continue to grow. Next. So what is food recovery? Well, you may have also heard it by several other names, including food rescue or food salvage. Whatever you, whatever you wanna call it, uh, I liked the simple and practical definition uh, given by the uh, De Florida's Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services. And for those of you who are joining us by phone, it goes something like this. Food recovery is the practice of collecting wholesome food that would otherwise go to waste and donating it to local food distribution agencies to help feed those in need. I really like that. And as you can see in our picture here, uh, this is food recovered at one of our pickup locations on one day last week. So given the growing trend in food recovery, plus the state's new food recycling rules, this is a great opportunity for municipalities to connect with and develop a meaningful, long-term support system along with their local food pantries and other food uh, assistance organizations. But what does a meaningful long-term support system look like? Well, it should include uh, elements that have been mentioned by previous speakers, including access to resources uh, like commercial kitchens, storage, and transportation vehicles. Refrigeration is a huge one. Uh, all of these are long-standing challenges for partners within our, our Replenish Food Pantry Network and it happens for a variety of reasons. But I'm, I, I really wanna talk about this sweet opportunity. There's a, there's a great opportunity out there that can help your community harness uh, essential elements for recovering, efficient recovery to retain both food safety and food quality with the ultimate goal of nourishing our neighbors in need. Next. All right, enter. Sustainable Jersey. Now, Sustainable Jersey has been working really hard for many, many years now to achieve what I think we wish for every New Jersey community, and that is environmental and social health, um, environmental stability, smart growth, equity, and resiliency. And I'm not gonna be able to go into uh, details about what Sustainable Jersey does so much uh, but I hope that you can find time again in your very busy schedules to hear uh, Sustainable Jersey speak on the full extent of their programs on September 23rd 
uh, that so please please uh, get in touch with NJDEP again and sign up for that really important presentation. Next. Now, for those of you who are a little bit more uh, familiar with Sustainable Jersey, there is certification programs uh, and uh, they have different levels. So, so the bronze and the silver certification. So for your municipality to earn bronze or cer silver certification status, uh, there are, these are some of the areas with actionable items that uh, will earn you a minimum of 10 points towards your certification goal. Uh, and these are really, really uh, useful in um, setting up your, your food assistance uh, uh, structure. And that includes community food bank and soup kitchen, um, expanded supplemental food programs, community gardens, and then there's even one about making uh, farmers market, markets more accessible. Now, if you look on the right, if your community has already achieved bronze or silver status, I just say, great job, kudos, uh, but just keep going, keep going. And there's a really, really great new chance to do that. This new gold star standard in health, which help, uh, health is uh, out there to help your system make the linkages between the services that lead to food security, health equity, and improved overall public health outcomes. So with that, you know, I, I just want to let you know, please, please feel free to reach out to Replenish to find out more about the day in and day out doings of food recovery. Or, you know, perhaps you're more interested in how uh, we're building collaboratives and mini networks within our network that Jennifer had touched on. Uh, and what we're really most proud, what we're most proud of, I think, in this evolution of our own food pantry or our food for food pantry into a food bank and a distribution system is that we created something that is now time and disaster tested and that time and disaster tested strong web of community support has really really starting to make a difference in Middlesex County so with that feel good end note I was wondering if we still have any time for questions. I think we have about five more minutes for questions. Yes, we do. Uh, we have a couple for Karen. Uh, and we have a couple, uh, we have one for you all. So for, at first I'm gonna talk, I'm going to ask about um, Karen's. Um, I believe this one is for Karen. It asks, um, what effect, if any, did COVID have on your programs? Um, so that question was about what effect COVID had on CET programs? Yes. Okay. I think the, the primary impact that COVID had was that a, a lot of, actually pretty much all of our work before that was done in person. So whether it was visiting businesses and institutions to do a physical site assessment and to, um, to look at what their practices were and give them recommendations on how they could reduce food waste, um, or whether that was workshops and meetings, they were all done in person. So um, we, we scrambled and were able to figure out how to do virtual site assessments, um, which has been really, really helpful and allowed us to do even more work um, across the country. We had already done some of that because um, there are obviously being based in Massachusetts, um, doing work in California or Oregon or other places that aren't nearby. Um, we were able to do some virtual work, but this allowed us to really completely pivot to doing a lot of virtual site assessments. Um, so, and I, I think the other part of it is that, again, there's a, there was an awareness of businesses so restaurants, for instance, were not there. They were closed and they weren't really <laughs> obviously they, they weren't able to, to look at food waste or anything. Um, and now that they're reopening, now that schools are reopening, um, we're kind of back on. Sorry to interrupt. Please put your camera back on. Apologies about that. Um, yeah, so, so we, we, um, we, we weren't able to work with some of the folks that we'd been working with previously, some of the restaurants, um, schools, et cetera, uh, but there were other businesses that were interested. So it definitely was an adjustment, uh, but I think that in the end, we learned a lot. And now that a lot of businesses are reopening, we're able to re-engage and to help them um, with what they need. Great, thank you. Uh, 
a couple more quick questions. Um, okay. Someone says, asks the example of Whole Foods partnering with Food Link is great. Um, what are the barriers to extending this model to all Whole Foods stores across states and other supermarkets? Um, sure. Well, I, I did work for Whole Foods Market for 19 years, and I did oversee sustainability in the New England region. So I'm very familiar with the food program, food donation programs, and all um, all regions had the same sort of program um, when I left Whole Foods in April 2020. So as far as I know, this should be something that they do. Um, you can certainly call local stores um, if you have questions and ask them what their programs are and what they do. Uh, in some cases, they may not um, have established those connections with local agencies and they may need some help. And in the case of Whole Foods Market, um, the decision was made several years ago to partner with Food Donation Connection to find specifically to find local agencies that would be able to make that kind of a connection. So, um, so that would be the other suggestion. But if anybody has any specific questions, I'm, I'm happy to help um, where I can. Thank you. And then um, also, do you have any projects aimed at reducing food waste at the source? If you have. Um, we, we, yeah, I, we, we do try to work with businesses um, and institutions to understand where their, uh, where their waste is. We, spe we do spend a lot of time on prevention, trying to, um, number one, stay on top of what the current, um, current technology, current uh, programs are. So you have everything from those apps like Too Good To Go or Flash Food, um, which are programs, which are apps that work with restaurants, grocery stores, et cetera, to help try to prevent food, um, as well as different kinds of technology, um, whether that's a lean path or food solutions or a winnow. So we try to stay on top of those things to help businesses. Um, and that's really our focus is we want to um, to help the marketplace, help the infrastructure in the marketplace to grow um, and to connect people where we can, um, as well as give that very direct assistance and actually get food waste reduced, donated, or diverted from businesses. Emily, Thank you, Karen. Emily yes. to uh, keep us on track here, what I'd like to suggest is if we have any additional questions, we, uh, we address those after the event with our speakers and get back to those who submitted them. I would like to keep us on schedule, but I know there's a lot of interest in this topic. So why don't yeah. we take that strategy here for the for today's event. Okay. Yeah, sounds good. Just want to mention real quickly, the DEP recycling website has lots of great information about food waste recycling, food waste reduction. We have information on the food waste reduction law. Uh, we have information on the new food waste recycling, uh, excuse me, food waste recycling law starting next month food waste reduction plan, we have educational resources, we have a great Facebook campaign. So the uh, DP Recycling website shortcut is now in your chat. So it's very easy to remember, it's recycle.nj.gov. So check that out. So why don't we move along to the next part of our program here, um, which is our cooking challenge, which is the DEP's version of the Chopped TV show. So let me reintroduce myself. My name is Ted Allen. As you may know, today's CHOP contestants were each given a basket with mystery ingredients from which they had to prepare a meal within 30 minutes. Our contestants were given unlimited access to the DEP's pantry and fridge. Well, to be perfectly honest with you, contestants were not given baskets with mystery ingredients, but rather they were instructed to use any food that is often wasted in their recipes. And the DEP does not have a pantry or a fridge. In fact, we don't even have a functioning cafeteria right now. And of course, no one will be chopped. Alex Guarnaschelli, Scott Conant, Marcus Samuelson, and the other regular chopped judges are not going to be with us today. So we will be asking you to vote for your favorite recipe at the end of this program. So you will see a poll posted later on. But let me backtrack for a moment and get serious. Earlier this year, the DB held its first food recovery cooking challenge for New Jersey culinary students. The cooking challenge was designed as part of our food waste reduction campaign to educate residents on various methods they can use to reduce food waste that they're generating at home. The challenge was open to students enrolled in college level culinary programs in New Jersey. Participating students submitted a video of themselves preparing an original recipe incorporating food that is often wasted. Participants were encouraged to use common food scraps 
that are readily available to the average home cook. The videos you're about to see were chosen as the four finalists. After the videos have been shown, you will be asked to vote for your favorite. Also, please note that a recipe booklet that includes all of the recipes shown in the videos can be downloaded from the handout section of the GoToWebinar webinar panel. Before we start up with the first video, I would like to mention that all of the recipes and videos that you're going to be watching are from the students in Professor Paul Takastov's food product development class in the Rutgers University Department of Food Science. So congratulations to, to Professor Takastov's class and go are you. So our first video is called the Kitchen Sink Dumplings. So I will ask Robin to start the show and we'll go through these videos and then we'll take our vote. You should be able to hear me now. I'm sure you were impressed by that just as I was. That was pretty amazing. Very nicely done. So our next video has got quite a, quite a recipe name. It's called Barbecue Banana Peel Quesadilla. So we'll, it's number two, video number two. Pretty amazing creativity out there, very impressive. Here's number three, which is meatballs with salad green pesto and spaghetti squash. Very nice, another excellent video. Our fourth and final video is called watermelon rind chutney. So we'll go right into that one. Okay, there we go, four excellent videos. And we will be, should be seeing the uh, poll up here, there we go. In the meantime, while people are voting, it looks like we have a few minutes, we could take a, some additional questions for Karen, Jennifer, and, and Olivia, if there are any. Emily, do we have any additional questions we can get to while we're doing the, the poll? Yeah, we do. Um, we have some questions for um, Jennifer and Olivia. Um, we're sorry we couldn't get them to, to them before. Um, so one of the questions that's asked is where can we find out, um, someone lives in Morris County and they're wondering where they can find out um, the food and security needs of the residents and how they can, can get involved in the community college, etc. Um, how they can kind of get involved in Morris County and understand what's going on. Jennifer, do you want to take this one? Uh, yeah, sure. So, um, Jennifer, please put your camera on too. Uh, so I'm um, looking to see, I, uh, Mar okay, Morris County. I have the Interfaith uh, Food Pantry of the Oranges, I believe, is in Morris County. So um, you might want to look them up uh, and try to get in touch with them to see what the needs are in Morris County and how you can get involved. Thank you, Jane. Um, and the next one is, how are you addressing veganism? And I think this is just a general question. You did um, address the specific uh, dietary um, requirements in your presentation, um, but how are you addressing like veganism and vegetarianism in general? Well, we we do try to you know take in and distribute all kinds of fresh fruits and vegetables, um, and most of our food pantries are making them available uh, to clients. And you know we do consider dietary uh, res restrictions that people have um, and do our best to meet those needs. But um, again, we're dealing with donations for the most part. So we have to work with what we're given. Um, but of course, we, we do have considerations for people's um, dietary restrictions. Right, and when food pantry reps come out, that's, that's um, 
that's largely a responsibility of the food pantry reps that do come out. They know their clients best. Uh, you have to remember uh, Replenish really serves as a distribution warehouse. So again, uh, Jennifer had talked about with food uh, foods that are recovered being donations, um, we do not have uh, such a control over what we receive. However, uh, I do know that we have several pantries who have certain dietary restrictions, either religious or uh, for a personal choice um, or for medical reasons. And, um, or they have clients, they have known clients with those conditions. And so uh, when we do find those things coming in in, in in a number, when we know that they're going to show up, we, I, I, I personally will direct them and let them know that they're available. Uh, tell them what I saw, or um, if we know that there's something of particular interest, if they do show up, then, then they, get, um, they get that information. Great. Uh, that's all the questions we have for you two. Thank you so much for your presentation and the work that you do. I actually have a question as well. Um, I, we're getting near the end of the backyard gardening season, but I le have learned over the past few years that food banks will accept produce, excess produce from your backyard garden. And I don't know if a lot of people know that. Do you guys promote that and advertise that? Yes, we definitely do. In fact, I had somebody here yesterday who just dropped off two zucchinis from his backyard. So um, people do know that they can uh, drop off their, their excess produce from their own home local gardens here. Um, we do work with our, our local cooperative extension and the master gardeners, and they have a, a, grow, a row for the hungry. Um, so we do make it known uh, on our social media pages and stuff that we encourage residents with excess homegrown produce to share with us or their local food pantry. That's great because I know, you know, I, how many zucchinis can you actually eat in your home? Like, you know, my daughter will come in with 20 zucchinis and 40 tomatoes. So I'm, we thankfully are, live pretty close to the Mercer Street Friends. So we've been donating stuff. But I don't think a lot of people know that in general. So I'm glad you guys are, are promoting that. Yeah. And I had one question for uh, Karen as well. Karen, are you still with us? Yes, I am. You know, next, as I mentioned, next month we have the food waste recycling law taking effect in New Jersey. Have you done? Have you been contacted by any New Jersey companies looking for help and how they can reduce their waste and and comply with this law? We have. I'm trying to think now. I don't think we've been directly like anyone has called our hotline. I would have to double check though because I don't always handle all the hotline questions. We do have both um, a, a hotline number as well as an email, and we definitely are in touch with various businesses in New Jersey. We've actually been working um, on an EPA grant um, on in New Jersey, as well as six other states in the Northeast. So we've already been doing some work um, with businesses. But I don't think too, too many businesses have reached out yet, but we're hoping that after the uh, workshop on the 13th, where we can offer some more information, that we'll be able to work more directly with businesses at that point. Yeah, that would be wonderful because this is a, this is a new area for a lot of companies who are large waste food waste generators. So Getting the assistance from an organization like yours would be invaluable. So that's that's good to hear. Thank you. Yeah, the other, other point I would make, Steve, is that there's also national or or larger um, businesses, like there's larger groceries who are uh, regional grocers. So we are working with, for instance, Ajo Del Hayes um, has multiple different um, banners. And so we're working with some of them at the national level. So it would impact, but it's different than, say, your local, you know, Hannaford's or whatever store calling us. So I think there's a little bit of both going on. Okay. Emily, do we have any other questions? We do not. Okay. Thank you. And Robin, how are we doing with the poll? We did very well with the poll. And now, before you announce the results, I just mm -hmm. want to mention one thing. As fans of the CHOP show know, the winner gets a check for $10,000. We are actually going to do even more than that. We are not giving a check for 10,000, but we are giving a DEP award certificate. You can't beat that. So it's a very nice certificate and all the submittals should are fantastic. So it's going to be, I'm sure it was a very tough vote, but I'll, I'll hand it over to, to Robin and I'm sorry for being such a wise guy. It, it was a, um, 
very interesting vote. I, I will say that the apparently our audience is not a fan of the more alternative recipes, um, including the banana peel and the watermelon rind. So we do not have a very adventurous um, attendees today. However, having said that, the, there is a clear winner and receiving 49% of the vote, it goes to the kitchen sink dumplings. And that video, uh, we don't have the names of all of the students that participated in that video. Um, the video was submitted by Sarah Kane. And so we'll be reaching out to Sarah and finding out the names of the other students who participated so that each of those students can receive their very valuable DEP certificate. Fantastic, congratulations to uh, the makers of the kitchen sink dumpling video. And as I said, they were all very creative, super, super job by all. And as I mentioned before, please remember to download the recipes before you exit. You have uh, four meals for the next four nights right there. So no complaining about what you eat tonight. So uh, before we leave, I'd just like to thank our speakers again for joining us today. Excellent job, it was very informative and I hope uh, our attendees learned quite a bit today and, and will continue to help promote food waste reduction in New Jersey and elsewhere. And again, we will send a link to the recording to all the participants in this webinar. So I want to thank you very much and I hope you all stay well and have a good day. Thank you.